Hi folks, you're with Tacitus today at your pushback channel. While you're with us, please take a moment to subscribe below and don't forget to hit that bell symbol for notification. So with all these SJW infected lawyers and infected judicial officers as well as SJW social workers, school and early learning psychologists and psychiatrists and counsellors, the entire legal machinery, public prosecutorial standards and case evaluation structure of most Western nations is now under majority SJW control at ground and at the mid-level. The upper echelons such as high courts and supreme courts and so on are still being fought over for who has control. How does all this SJW legal stuff play out at the practical, at the street level, at the case level, the level that affects you and me? In real terms, what can and what does it mean to you and I? What is the effect of all these low IQ SJW operatives running around creating panic and spreading legal ideological havoc? I believe they now form a network of interacting activists. They create the social and moral panic with fake studies of rape and racism epidemics, Nazis are everywhere they assert, and these so-called Nazis must be brought to SJW kangaroo courts of justice. So let's look at an example of this and be very scared as SJW justice is not the friend of impartial law, not the friend of facts and certainly not the friend of evidence, nor is it the friend of due legal process in courts of law. And the following could happen to you, me or anyone. So a gender study student is doing intern work at an early learning centre. She thinks she overheard a four-year-old boy mention something inappropriate after emerging from the toilets. Keen to curry favour with her gender studies lecturer, who is a well-known lesbian feminist and vitriolic male-hating misandrist, the student, who coincidentally is also a lesbian, a pursuit actively encouraged by her lecturer, she advises what she has heard and asks the lecturer if this is evidence of male oppression, child abuse by fathers and males, abuse of children. The academic, the lecturer, that is, says it probably is, and what's more, it must be the father. The father must be guilty, and she will refer the matter to a special child protection officer in the Orwellian-named Department of Families. What the lecturer does not disclose is this officer in child protection is the lecturer's lesbian lover and also a fervent activist, hater of heterosexual men and hater of the family unit. No opportunity to destroy a hetero man and a hetero family can be passed up and what better cover story than purporting to be protecting children. If anyone questions it, so you're against protecting children, is that what you're saying you fascist Nazi abusive white male patriarch? The SJW hate machinery swings into action with astonishing swiftness. There's no time for evidence. There's no time for facts. There's no time for proof. No time for due legal process. A child is at risk. Experts have said so. Some reaction must be taken and taken now. The child is abducted. Oh, sorry, taken into protection by the state as the bewildered father arrives to collect the child from the early learning school. White heterosexual male police are on hand to rough up the father if he protests. His screaming son is being dragged away by strangers. What's his problem? This is SJW justice and you better damn well get used to it. The gloating smirk on the face of the man-hating activist lesbian child protection officer as the man's son is dragged away pretty much says it all. He's not a rich man and most to ponder these goings on and not either. If he could afford a phalanx of top draw lawyers, maybe he could wipe the smug smirk off the face of these venal and hateful SJWs before the inferno began and rescue his son from the many months of SJW inflicted trauma. I have seen firsthand the difference when a seriously heavyweight lawyer, and I mean a seriously heavyweight lawyer, enters the scene. Suddenly the sneering SJW activists are not so big and tough anymore. But this father can only afford a lightweight lawyer, and even paying for this will be a struggle for him and his family. What he does not know is this lawyer he has hired is mostly reliant on government work with a decent amount of it coming from the child protection and associated departments. This lawyer is virtually a client dependent of the child protection people and he doesn't want to do anything to upset them and through that upset his income. And the department quietly reminds him of this fact. So this lawyer that the father's hide goes soft and treats the absurdly false and ideologically motivated allegations as de facto truth. He even tries to get the father to take a plea bargain. He might get a five-year good behaviour bond. Save your son the endless questions and interrogations. You do care about your son, don't you? Well, spare him this and take the plea. You will see your son again in a few years once the department is satisfied. 
even the lawyer he's paying for is in effect an agent to the SJW machine representing its interests and not those of his client. A special child evaluation psychologist is brought in, a consultant frequently used by the Child Protection Department, billed as an independent expert no less. The father is momentarily relieved. The child psychologist would confirm, I'm not an abuser of my son, says the father. Truth and fact will prevail. However, it's all going to be quite expensive, perhaps more than $10,000, even $15,000, just this one aspect of the case by the time expert witness evidence has been given in court. But what the father has not been told is the so-called independent child psychologist is neither expert nor independent. She is part of the male-hating and hetero-family-hating lesbian cabal is everywhere in the Child Protection Department, and she delivers with 100% reliability verdicts that all fathers are abusers. Even the totalitarian states like Stalin's Soviet Union could not achieve such one-sided legal outcomes. Moreover, this psychologist was affirmative actioned through university, claiming a big slab of victim points for being female, lesbian and one-eighth black. She gets a lot of work from child protection because of her absolute reliability in asserting all men are guilty, white hetero male guilt. And her reports can carry considerable weight in these specialist child protection courts. The father and mother of the child are not sophisticated people, and there is something almost pathetic in their naivety, their blind belief in the courts and justice for all, their faith in the so-called experts, the humble, fearful looks on their faces they hang on every word the judge says. They think their lawyer is their only friend. They weep during the one hour per week heavily supervised sessions permitted by the court with their son and cannot understand why they are being treated like criminals. They have fully remortgaged their house now, which adds to their worries and stress. They have applied to the courts for the child's grandparents, who the child has been close to to look after the the son, so at least he's not with strangers. The Child Protection Case Office claims they have reason to believe the grandfather is also a child abuser, so the judge denies the request. The family then tries the, the father's brother, the child's uncle. He too is magically now a child abuser. Now, fathers who commit perjury in child protection courts are are frequently given jail time. And just a few questions from the bench or or the lawyer, had he been up to it, could have easily established the child protection officer was committing perjury in a court of law. But no such questions were asked and no such search for the truth took place. The judge had formerly been a child protection officer prosecutor and he gained his job as a result of intensive lobbying by the men-hating, family-hating radicals in the child protection industry. Some may say the judge was hardly impartial. To everybody in the chain of events, they are linked by their activism, their ideological passions, all attend the same SJW indoctrination courses and all believe an allegation in this area is as good as a conviction and due legal process is an annoying irritant they must reluctantly pay lip service to. And any and all perjury is fully acceptable when getting at straight white middle class men. The parents lost the case. So the grandparents poured in their retirement savings and other family members to pay for an appeal, which took the matter out of the activist child court into a proper court of law. Most people could not afford to do this. Even so, it ruined them all financially and they will probably never recover from this. In the event, they won the appeal and their son has been returned to them. 18 months of unimaginable misery was endured. The perjuring activists who inflicted this insanity on a completely innocent family and an innocent man do not even get so much as a reprimand. They are free to do the same thing again tomorrow and then again after that, to falsely accuse some other innocent man and to traumatise more bewildered children. It is true that strident activists, and particularly lesbians, are drawn to child protection and the industry has become so activist that these strident activists are openly preferred as employees, contractors and consultants. So fevered are the minds of these activists, they do not see their jobs as upholding, abiding by and enforcing the law, but rather an ideological reordering of society at taxpayer expense. Such a situation obviously creates many distortions, such as which cases they choose to prosecute, which cases make it to court, the smug, righteous vindictiveness that consumes these folks when the falsely accused fight back drunk with the power of pouring taxpayer money into lunatic lesbian ideological crusades of crushing innocent citizens, with a distinct preference for targeting white, middle-class, hetero males. Having these taxpayer dollars to throw around, it's, it's not ideological play money for activists to throw about. Why is there no impartial financial oversight? It's badly needed. 
Perhaps the only way to restore confidence in these growing areas of SJW social law is to ensure every operative involved, and that is every operative, passes an impartiality test, or that there are strict hiring procedures to ensure no activists or activist contractors or subcontractors are hired or there be severe penalties for perjury and conspiracy to commit perjury, which is openly done in this area of law, and that these are rigorously investigated and enforced. These are among the vital questions of our times. What sort of justice system do you want? Please leave your comments below. You've been with Tacitus today at your Pushback channel, and thank you for listening.